All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Neville. I am business development manager with the Entrust Group. And with me today, I have Kevin Amolsch from Pine Financial Group. Uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, trust deeds. This is actually the second webinar we've done on trust deeds investing this year. We've taken a little bit of a different approach for the second one. And Kevin's going to talk about how experts find and vet trustee investments. So let's go ahead and get started. Kevin, you wanna pop me on in the next page? So obviously, or always before we do this event, I bring this page up. Uh, essentially what this says is that this webinar is for educational purposes only, uh, that Entrust is not, we don't sell any investments, we don't advise, we don't recommend or promote or endorse any particular investment. Uh, we will process and hold any non-traditional asset that you want to hold inside your self-directed IRA with us, but it's up to you to do all your own due diligence. So make sure before making any investment, uh, whether with Entrust or otherwise, that you uh, consult the advice of attorneys, financial advisors, CPAs, anybody like that. Uh, but it won't be anybody at Entrust that, that gives you any advice. So what we're going to talk about today is what is a trust deed and how you can make money from it, uh, how you can find opportunities, what you should do for due diligence wise for looking at trust deeds, how to reason appraisal, and then uh, pitfalls to avoid when it comes to trust deed investing. This is me. Go ahead, flip through it. 14 years. Actually, I'm up to 14 years. We need to update this page. And uh, my role is to help educate people on how you can invest in alternative assets inside your retirement account. So Entrust, we have been in business since 1981. We are custodians and record keepers of what are called self-directed retirement accounts, uh, which are IRAs, 401k plans, in which you make all your own investment decisions and you can invest in non-traditional assets. You're not limited to just stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The majority of our staff uh, are certified IRA service professionals, CISP. Uh, we hold monthly educational web webinars. This is our, our uh, September webinar. And we also have a, an IRA academy where we help train uh, other people in our space about uh, um, IRAs and retirement plans and essentially trains them to take and pass the certified IRA services professional uh, class. We're the only company in the space that has that certification to do that. We current, as I mentioned, we've been in business since 1981. We currently have about $5 billion uh, of assets. Uh, in our lifetime, we've had approximately 45,000 investors that have had accounts with Entrust. We currently have uh, somewhere between 24, 25,000 investors, account holders. Uh, again, been in business since 1981, so over 40 years we've been in business. And one of the ways we differentiate ourselves from our competitors is that we provide you a single point of contact. So if you have an account with Entrust, you don't just call an 800 number and get whoever happens to pick up the phone that you might get with a lot of, uh, of our competitors in our space. You get me or one of my colleagues and our associate as your single point of contact. All right, at this point, I'm going to take my video off and I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to let Kevin take over. I'll remind everybody that we're going to answer questions at the end. So feel free to uh, type in the Q&A box any questions that you have, whether they're for me about self-directed IRAs or for Kevin about trustee investing. And then we'll answer uh, all the questions at the end. So you can type them in now or you can wait until the end. All right, Kevin, floor is yours. Thank you, Bill and Andrew, both of you, so much for inviting me on today. And I also want to thank everyone that's here attending with us. Um, gosh, there's a lot of things you could be doing right now, and you chose to spend a little bit of time with us. So super appreciate that. And I promise to do the best I can to bring you some fantastic information today. Now, Interest mentioned, or Bill mentioned, that they had done a trustee investing class earlier and so they asked me to just step it up a little bit. That's why we're calling this 2.0, but it's a more advanced um, class, something that I've never taught before, but we're peeling back the curtain a little bit, um, trying to help you find deals and trying to keep you safe. So disclaimer, 
I've got the same one, so I'm not going to really go over it. This is education only. We're not selling securities here. Um, so as Bill said, my name is Kevin. It's Kevin Amol. I'm the founder of Pine Financial Group. Pine Financial has been in business since 2008. I've actually been raising private money and lending private money, trustee investing since 2006. And we're approaching, in fact, we'll hit this month $1 billion in origination. So getting close to 2,600 transactions. That's a picture there of me and my amazing family. We, uh, we're a blended family with five kids, all teenagers, as you could see. Uh, similar in age and attitude. Okay, topics. <clears throat> we already went over that. So this is what we're talking about today. Um, so what is private debt? So what is trustee investing? Now, that's interesting that I put on this slide private debt, and we're talking about trustee investing, but hard money lending, private money lending, private debt, even private credit, all of those have the same meaning. And it's very simple. It's a, just an ind individual or non-institutional lender loaning to a real estate, typically a real estate investor or developer, which is someone loaning to someone else, right? So it could be secured or unsecured. For the uh, conversation here today, we're definitely talking about secured lending. Now I'm trying to keep you safe. Uh, terms can vary greatly, which we can get into some detail if you'd like on that, but it's not uncommon to get returns of 10 to 12 percent. That's actually pretty standard in the industry, uh, but you could even increase that by fees, profit sharing, those kind of things. You could really increase your returns. Um, and there's lots of other reasons why private debt or trusted investing is attractive to IRA investors um, because it's secure and it's, it's very consistent. Um, so you're not going to have to weather these ups and downs. And I think that's why savvy investors really like this type of investment. In fact, you see real estate investors start, a lot of them start in single family, and then they progress through their career. Maybe some go into the commercial world, but a lot of them go into the hard money lending space. Um, and there's a reason for that. So how do you find these opportunities? How do you get your 8, 9, 10, 12% returns secured by real estate, nice and steady, uh, stable investment. How do you find them? Well, <clears throat> the first thing we need to understand is we're not looking for deals necessarily. What we're looking for is borrowers and we're letting our borrowers go out and find the real estate deal. So once we can focus in on finding uh, borrowers that need your money to do their project, um, that makes it much easier to do, do your marketing campaigns or whatever your strategy is to go out and find those deals. So hands down, number one, no question, is networking. This is how you're going to find your deal. So I put in here realtors, friends and family, real estate investment groups, title companies, and wholesalers. Um, wholesalers, I'm going to touch on here. If you're not sure what that is, a wholesaler um, goes out and finds re real estate opportunities, but they don't want to do the rehab, let's say. So they find an opportunity and they flip it quickly to another real estate investor that's going to do a fix and flip. So they might mark the property up a little bit, uh, maybe make five, 10 grand, and then and then let somebody else do the, the heavy lifting and make the bigger payday. Um, the reason why wholesalers are a fantastic referral source um, is because that's all they're doing is deals and they need their buyers to have money to close on their deals so that they can make their five, 10, 15 grand, right? So they're I mean, good wholesalers are doing multiple of these a month, so they have a nice, steady stream of opportunities for lenders. So I would definitely target wholesalers. Realtors are always great, um, friends and family, real estate investment groups. There's a lot of, um, you know, we, we call them RIAs, real estate investment associations. So just add an A on there. And then there's a, there's a national RIA. So I would maybe just get in there and Google national RIA and you'll find your local real estate investment clubs, and then I would become a part of those and then go out there and network. Um, an important piece here that I think a lot of people miss when networking, you're not in there trying to give business cards and tell everybody what you do. Um, although it's nice when you get asked the question, what do you do? Because then you could go into your elevator pitch, which by the way, we should have one of those. Um, but what your goal should be in the room is to collect business cards. So not hand out, but collect. And the reason I say that is because you really want to build up a good network. And then you can start adding value to the network. Very similar to what Bill um, is doing here by providing free information. So if you have a network and you're giving value, um, that's when they're going to want to actually work with you. So they do have to know what you do, but they, they want to get value from you. 
Now, people do business with people they know, like, and trust. We all know that. So let's speed up the know, like, and trust process <clears throat> by building a database and adding value. Okay, seminars. This is a fantastic way to find borrowers. Um, very similar to what we're doing right now. If you're doing webinars or you're out there doing one or two hour live in-person classes, it's really how I got started. Um, you get a room of 20, 20, 25 people and you get to be the expert in front of the room, <clears throat> help them make money and then offer your services. Um, it works really, really well. You can advertise. Um, we at Pine Financial, we do quite a bit of advertising for borrowers <clears throat> to get money loaned out. Um, but I would say at the beginning, and especially if it's just you're just doing this with your IRA, um, you might not want to do that because there's an expense involved and there's time involved. Um, you don't just throw an ad out there and hope it works. To be good and have a good return on your investment dollar, um, you need to track that and see what's working, what's not, tweaking it, um, maybe hiring a, a marketing team, something like that. So it can get a little intense. Um, but you could do free advertising too, I suppose, the offer up or Facebook marketplace, Craigslist. I think Craigslist still exists. So all of those work and they're typically free. So um, I guess I shouldn't be dogging too hard on advertising. Uh, so you could do the free ones. Uh, but networking and seminars, those are going to be your two top producers, in my opinion, <clears throat> outside of this one. Um, so a lot of hard money lending companies um, or mortgage brokers um, have opportunities that they um, that they they want to give you, let's say, or they can't like a mortgage broker that cannot handle. So real quick story. It was when I, early on in my career, I was getting started. Um, I had a mortgage broker call me because he had a borrower that wanted to buy a rental property. It was a fantastic rental property, but he couldn't get it closed because it wasn't habitable. And the only reason in this story that it wasn't habitable is because there was no closets in the bedrooms. Um, someone had went with, damaged it with a sledgehammer. It was a foreclosure property. Um, so in the appraisal, they, they have no conforming bedrooms because a bedroom to be conforming needs egress, ingress, and a closet. And so there's nowhere to hang your clothes. It was not considered a bedroom. So they couldn't get the loan. Um, the gentleman called me. I was able to fund it with private money. And he was able to finish out the closets, get it repaired, and then refinance with that same mortgage broker. And he kept it as a rental property. So that ended up being a real great win-win-win situation. Uh, but then there's also private loan brokers. So <clears throat> like Pine Financial occasionally will sell off our, our notes um, to individual investors just to free up cash so we can go out and make loans. Uh, I know other hard money lenders do that as well, or they will actually just broker a loan. So they would take one IRA investor and one real estate investor doing a fix and flip. They'll bring them together and charge a fee to do that. <clears throat> so that could be some opportunities there. So if you're looking for a real easy way to get in, make your eight, nine, 10, 11% returns um, and have somebody else do all the work for you, including the servicing, um, maybe look at um, going to a loan, private loan broker or a hard money lender and see if they have any notes that they would be willing to sell you. All right, so what, now you have your opportunities coming in. How do you underwrite it? How do you do your diligence? How do you know it's a, a loan you want to be funding? Uh, so here's what we do at Pine to make sure that we and our investors stay safe. So we get a full financial picture of the borrower. Um, we're going to get a full picture of the asset as well. But we start with a personal financial statement with our borrower, which includes income, expense, um, and their net worth. So their assets and their liabilities. Uh, and then we are going to verify this. So we're going to go out and get some supporting documents. Supporting documents might be tax returns, make sure that they're telling you the truth on how much money they make outside of their fix and flip they're doing, um, or um, bank statements. Look, this is the number one. We re-underwrite every default we have. So let's say we have a default, we have, have a foreclosure, and all, we go through the whole process. We sit down and go back and re-underwrite the loan. And what I've learned through that process, the number one reason borrowers fail or default on your private money loans or trust deeds is lack of liquidity. They don't have the reserves needed in case there's a problem. And I'll tell you, even the best fix and flippers go over budget. It is so ridiculously hard to stay inside a construction budget. <clears throat> Even the most experienced investors miss. So if we don't have reserves, that is a loan that could go bad. So make sure, make sure your client has some liquidity in case they go over their budget. And of course, in case they need to make payments on the loan or whatever it is, 
Um, I recommend a 10% um, of the loan amount in liquidity set aside so that they can handle the project. So we're going to verify that with bank statements. We pull a credit report. I know some lenders don't do that. I think it's probably a good idea to make sure that your borrower pays their bills before you loan them money. So I would recommend pulling a credit report. We pull all three bureaus and take and we use this the middle of uh, the score in the middle to qualify. We like to see a 650 credit score or higher. Um, there's some we would go below that with some compensating factors like a fantastic deal or some uh, extra liquidity. Um, but I would recommend highly that you're going to pull a credit report. And one of the things we're looking for in this credit report are um, public records. So foreclosures, judgments, something that could become a problem on um, tax lien, something that could be a problem on the real estate deal that you're looking at. But also look at debt. Like how are they handling their credit cards and personal loans? Are they maxing everything out? Does it look like there might be a storm coming um, or you know, a potential bankruptcy coming because they're over leveraged? Uh, not necessarily just have they made all of the payments, but there's other items in that credit report that are important to look at. Identity theft is another one. Uh, it, it verifies addresses and social security numbers. So all that information is there. Uh, title commitments. Um, you know, title insurance policies are an interesting insurance policy because it's the only insurance policy that insures of all the risks that are that already happened. So everything in the past. Most insurance, as we know, insures you against things that might happen in the future. Um, title com commitments are, is there anything that could impact the title that happened prior to the day of closing? Um, and then there's two title policies. You have your owner's policy, which protects your client, the borrower, and then you have a lender's policy, which is gonna protect you. So if you wanna make sure that you're in a first lien position, and if anybody tries to jump in front of you, which does happen at times, um, you want to have a lender's title policy ensuring that position so that you have defense in case there's any problems down the road. And this is stuff that your borrower pays for, so it's not going to cost you a dime. It's very, it's very well accepted in the industry that the borrower pays these fees as part of their closing fees. Um, insurance, I want to touch on this one because um, although it sounds obvious, we want to insure the asset to the real estate. Um, there's a couple of different types of property insurance. Um, and if you don't have the right one, you're not insured. So I'll give you an example. Most insurance brokers that do not understand fixed and flipped business will issue non-owner occupied insurance policies um, to insure the property. So that would be like a landlord policy. You're not living there. Cool. Here's the landlord policy. The problem with that policy um, is they have vacancy clauses. Every single one of them have vacancy clauses. The vacancy clause says this. If the property sits vacant for, say, 30 days or 60 days, there, there's some variance there, somewhere between that and those two numbers. So let's say it's, it's 30 days. If it, it sits vacant for 30 days or more, there's no insurance at all. Um, so let's be careful to make sure that we get our builder's risk um, or vacant property policy. Those are the two that we would be looking for. And there's only a handful of carriers that do it. Um, so you're looking at your four, your foremost or your Zurich, uh, Lloyd's of London. Those are like the three top. All right, repair estimate. We always wanna know what's going to be done to the property um, so that we know how to value the property because depending on their plan, it could have a different value. Are you finishing a basement? Are you adding an addition? Or are you just doing a kitchen bath remodel? And the <clears throat> repair estimate, you know, another thing that's important, a lot of real estate investors will do is they'll underestimate what it's gonna actually cost. Um, so that we see that a lot. It's pretty common. Now, for us, since we see so many of these, it's easy for us to say, okay, you're not going to get a kitchen done for that price, right? But maybe if you're newer into the industry, the way that you protect yourself is to get that estimate and then have a like a contractor review it and make sure that they agree with that. Or don't just get an estimate, have them go out and get bids. And then before you close on your loan, before you loan them your money, make sure that they have bids from a contractor that you could take a look at those. And then finally, we want to get an appraisal. Not all lenders get appraisers. Some, some lenders think that they are very good at doing desktop appraisals or they could do their own valuation and that's fine. We happen to want to shift some risk. We want a third party neutral to give us an opinion of value. So we always get appraisals. So that's what I want to spend a little bit of time here talking about is 
if you're getting appraisals, what are you doing? Like, how do you review them? How do you know that they're accurate? If you're not going to get an appraisal, what are some of the things that you should be looking for to make sure you're getting the correct value? Um, I did say that making sure that reserves is hyper important, and it is. You want to make sure that they have reserves. But when all else fails and you're going to end up getting a property back, they default and you have to foreclose, what's going to protect your money is that real estate. So you want to make sure that you have the, the correct value and you want to be at a low loan to value. I would not go over 70% of the value. So if the value is 100 grand on the house, do not loan over $70,000 in a real quick, simple example. All right, so when you're looking at an appraisal or when you're looking to value the property as an appraiser would, um, the comps are everything. That, that's the most important thing, selecting the correct comps. We're going to talk a little bit more about, about that, um, but we want to have a good location. We want the styles to be similar. Uh, we want the age to be similar if we can. Otherwise, we have to adjust, which I'll talk about in a minute. Condition, so we're looking for fixed and flip houses, um, and then the size. So a style, interesting, and in an environment like we're in right now, it's very, um, the inventory is very tight in most markets. So you're not going to see a lot of variance between the different styles. The values will be pretty similar as long as the size and location are good. But when the market loosens up, like some of us are expecting, um, then you're going to start seeing some variances. So I'll give you an example. The, the ranch style or rambler style home, one level, bedrooms, bathrooms, kitchen, everything on one level. That's the most attractive style. People will pay more for that um, in a higher inventory environment than they would a two-story or a bi-level or some kind of multi-level property. So uh, be careful with that because I've seen that catch people at times. Um, maybe they, they're they rehabbing a bi-level, which is probably the least attractive style, um, and they're comparing it against ranch styles and they end up getting their valuation wrong. All right, the two most... <clears throat> The two most important things here are the location and size. I did put it here. Please do not rely on Zillow. I hear that sometimes still. People rely on the Zillow value. Um, so when you're doing a, when you're doing comparables, what we're looking for is comparing an apple to an apple. If this house was the exact same and it sold for two hundred thousand, then the property I'm looking at should sell for two hundred thousand, right? If they're the exact same. But houses aren't the exact same. Maybe the one over here is. Uh, 200 square feet bigger or has a bigger garage or a finished basement and, and this one doesn't. So what we have to do is make adjustments to our comparable to make the orange an apple. We want to compare an apple to an apple. So how do we make it an apple? We have to adjust for it. So to give you an example, if if the house that I'm, the comparable house is bigger, it should be worth more, right? So I need to bring the, the value down to make it comparable. And we're going to go through some of those adjustments in a second. What I want to point out here is location. Um, so often I hear people say, well, it's, it's within a half a mile. This should be a great location. Well, that, that's indicating to me that you're looking at a radius, right? It's within a half a mile of this property as a radius, but that's the, that is the an inappropriate way to find the best comp because a radius might put you into a different neighborhood. So what appraisers, good appraisers do, and what you should do to stay safe, is to make sure you're staying inside the neighborhood. So all this is is a screenshot of a recent appraisal um, out in Minnesota. And you can see here that this is the Mississippi. In this red area, this is where we want all of our comps. Okay? And this down here might be, maybe that's three quarters of a mile, and maybe right across here is only half a mile. So you would think this one's closer, it should be a better comp, but it's not because this is a different neighborhood up there. I hope you guys could see my pointer. Um, and then you can see we don't want anything right up against the water. That's going to have a, a higher value, so it's not a it's not a comparable. So we're we're bringing in the um, the line that we don't want to cross away from the water, and we're staying inside the neighborhood. So this is another example in Denver. And if there's anybody on the call from Denver, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. This is Martin Luther King. Uh, I think a lot of major cities have a Martin Luther King. In Denver, what happens here is if you cross over this street, it becomes a, a completely different neighborhood. It might be a 15, 10 to 15% difference in value, which is significant. Um, so in this example, you can see it's we're going really close up to Martin Luther King, our subject property, and, and none of the comparables are crossing that street. We're going, we're coming several blocks down here. This would be more of a uh, like more comparable property 
than anything just, just right across the street here. Um, so again, my point I'm trying to make is stay inside the neighborhood. Do not do a radius. All right, when we're looking at a comp grid, this is one out of a, an actual appraisal. Um, what we're looking at here is, <clears throat> this is a subject property on Dexter Street. Okay, so this is gonna give us all of the, the specs, if you wanna call it that, all the statistics on the subject property. And then we're gonna take our comps. So you have comp one, comp two, and comp three. So that's what we're looking at. And then you can see that we're gonna have adjustments lost my thing, here it is. We're gonna have little adjustments. So we're bringing the value down 3,000 here. We're, we're increasing at 10,000 here. We're increasing at 20,000 here. Um, so I'm just walk through a couple of these quickly. I know we don't have a ton of time, but um, for us and for me personally, I'm looking for a net value. So I require that our appraisers adjust for seller concessions. Um, it's not standard. A lot of appraisers won't do that unless you ask them. And if you're out there pulling your comps, you may miss that or not want to do it as well. But a seller concession to me is highly important because it's bringing that the amount of money I get as the owner of that property down, right? So it's a $652,000 purchase, but I'm giving you $3,000 back towards closing costs. My actual price is only $649,000. So that's why you're seeing, uh, you're seeing a $3,000 adjustment down. Conventional loan, $3,000 adjustment, boom. Okay, uh, quality of construction, we're going to quality three to quality four. So three is better than four. So we're increasing the value 20, okay? And let me, I'm gonna go through another slide so you can see more of these adjustments. Okay, that's the size. That's, uh, that's the important piece I wanted to share with you on location. Now, size is another one that is really important when you're looking at comparables. Um, and what I see sometimes is, well, let's just look at all the properties in the area. Let's get an average price per square foot that things are selling for. And then we'll use that as our adjustment when we're trying to um, you know, make the apple an apple. Well, that's really not a good way to do it. Um, you can see here that we're doing $114, um, $114 per foot adjustment above grade and $20 per foot below grade. They're adding another $20 per foot for uh, basement finish. So a fully finished basement would adjust $40 per foot below grade, and it would go 114, three times that if it's above grade. So it's high, it's a lot more valuable above grade than below grade is that, that's what it's telling us. But the price per foot here is gonna be probably closer to $400 a foot, and we're only adjusting 114. Um, and then you can see, so we have a 1,297 square foot subject property with a 1,700 square foot comparable. And the comparable is worth more because it's bigger. So let's adjust it down to make that an apple. Okay. And we're just, all we're doing is taking the difference and multiplying it by $114 uh, per foot. Now I get questions often. Well, how do you come up with the square foot adjustment? What number should I use? So, and, and I can tell you that there's no science to this. this is all, all of this is opinion. But what I've seen after looking at thousands of appraisals this is my rule of thumb. So I'm make sure I'm clear here. This is my rule of thumb. This is not what you will learn in appraiser school, not what you will learn in real estate school, and not what an appraiser would tell you to do. Okay, I've just seen that this works actually pretty darn well. So it's what I would use. Um, and I would take one fifth, one fifth of the average of my three comparables. So if I take my, my price per foot of this one, price per foot of this one, price per foot of this one, add those together, divide by three, I would get my average. And then I divide my average by five. And that gets me pretty darn close to where I should be using as a price per foot adjustment. Right, is there anything else on here? I should probably show you. So two car garage, this one does not have a car garage. So we're adjusting $10,000 per garage bay. But you could just see if you go through this, anything that makes it different, uh, baseboard heat compared to forced air, you have an adjustment. So those are the types of things you'll see uh, for adjustments. One thing I don't think I saw in here and I wanted to point out is site size. So a lot of times I'll hear, well, my lot's bigger, it should be worth more. When we're talking about neighborhoods, especially like suburban type neighborhoods, you're not gonna see adjustments for lot sizes, guys. So 6250 standard Denver lot, then you have you know 7,000 or 
8,000 foot, so this is 2,000 feet bigger, there's still zero adjustment for the lot sizes. So don't get caught up on, um, well, this is a corner lot with a big yard. Um, you, there's just, there's no value in that. And I think there's something else I want to point out. Yeah, the bedrooms and bathrooms. This is, I think this might be my last one <clears throat> when it comes to going through appraisers that I, I want to get in here because I see it, the mistake made a lot. We're comparing a three bedroom to a four bedroom. So the four bedroom has to be worth more. Or my property has got three bedrooms and this comparable has got two. So my property is worth more. Um, that is very true when we're talking about rentals because it will create increased rental income. But it is absolutely not true when we're talking about a fix and flip or just a regular real estate deal. And I think the reason for that is you're already capturing that bedroom likely in the square footage adjustment. So if you're adjusting for square feet, and the bedroom, you could be double counting that square footage, okay? But we, do, we don't see adjustments um, for bedrooms. And here's some proof of that. We have a two-bedroom subject property with one bathroom. Here's a three-bedroom with one bathroom, no adjustment. Okay? The adjustment here, this $10,000 adjustment or close to $10,000 is because of the size difference, okay? This one also three-bedroom, one bath, no adjustment. If I go up to this, these comparables up here, three bedroom to a four bedroom, no adjustment. Okay. There. Is there any more that I can show you? Because this one people push back on me all the time. Three bedroom, four bedroom, no adjustment. Okay. Again, the adjustments in the size. Now you will see adjustments for bathrooms. That does add value. Okay. But again, the bedrooms do not add value. All right, so why do investors like private debt? I'm sure in the other webinar that Bill went through trustee investing, they probably talked a lot about that. Like how much money can you make and how do you stay safe? And how do you, I mean, well, why is it a good investment? So I didn't want to spend a lot of time on that here today, but look, this is a great investment. It is good investment for uh, your IRA with interest, um, whether you work with, us or another private lender, if you're out there doing it on your own, it is a highly lucrative, consistent, secure investment. Okay, But you have to be careful. you got to be safe about it. Here are some of the pitfalls that I see uh, trustee investors make. And, and I do get calls, a couple of them a month, actually, significant amount. Um, the people got themselves into trouble and they're asking me how, I could, you know, how to get out of the trouble. Sometimes it's not so easy. It's much easier to, to get out of the trouble if you never get in it. So let's uh, let's try to keep you safe here. So misunderstanding property value. If you miss on that value, it, it could cost you. And there's something else I didn't say, but you know when you're talking about location, a, lo a negative location influence like a commercial building or a gas station or I've seen like a bar uh, next right next door to a, a bar with loud music. And those are going to impact the value, obviously. The problem is it's very difficult to know how much is that view of that office building, how much does that impact the value? What kind of adjustments should I be making? It's very, very difficult. And appraisers will tell you this too. And tell that property sales, you don't really know. So my advice, especially if you're getting started or you're newer, do not finance properties that have negative uh, location influences, railroad tracks, uh, 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 you know, office buildings, other commercial any of that, gas stations, any of that, you want to try to stay away from those if you can, unless you have a really good idea of what that will do to the value. Okay. Risk of junior positions. So a lot of lenders don't have enough, a lot of trustee investors don't have enough money to fund an entire transaction. So they, well, I really want to get involved. I really want to do this, but I don't have enough money. So I'm just going to loan a second mortgage to the investor and then I'll secure it with the real estate. Well, the problem with that, you guys, is there's no collateral if you can't pay off that first. If that first starts to foreclose um, and they do foreclose, you get wiped off the title. You have no collateral. The only way to protect your money in that case is to come up with money and pay off the first. And Bill would be a good one to ask this question to, but I don't think you could just put a bunch of money into your IRA, even if you have it, to buy out that first. Okay. there's limits on how much you could contribute. So I would say stay in a senior position, especially with your IRA money. Um, there's other things you could do. You can invest in a mortgage fund. So something that Planning Financial does, we 
we, we operate a couple of mortgage funds. That's a way to get in with a lesser amount and not do a full one. Um, but just please, guys, do not go into junior positions here. Um, fractionalized notes, another thing that I see investors do is they team up and go in on a note together. Sounds great until there's a problem because then who's responsible for what? Um, who gets the house when you actually go through the foreclosure? Who's going to manage the process? It's fine until it's not, right? So be careful with both juniors and fractionalized notes. Insurance, we talked about that. I think I covered that pretty well, but um, make sure that you have your title insurance, the lender policy. Make sure you have your vacant property policy um, for your hazard insurance in case there's a fire or something like that. And look, we have contractors with power tools and ladders. Um, there's always risk here. So let's make sure we have the appropriate insurance. Um, and then proper servicing. You have to be on top of these. So this is not completely passive unless you're investing with um, you know, a, a hard money lender that services a loan for you. You have to collect the payments. Um, you know, Bill and, and interest, they're not going to service a loan for you. You have to get the payment to them, but they're not going to go out and try to collect it for you, right? So you have to do that. If there's a problem, you have to work it out. If you get the property back, you're going to have to manage all of that. So uh, the servicing side is an important piece to keeping your money safe as well. Um, I, so I, I think with that, I don't know, Bill, if we go through some questions now on this, or do you want to cruise through your section and then um, take the questions? Yeah, go ahead to the next slide. So I'm just going to talk real quickly on how you do these kinds of investments in an IRA. This will just take a few minutes and then we'll get to the Q&A. Uh, so again, remind everybody, you can go ahead and type your question in and uh, and we're going to we're going to answer them all at the end. Go ahead to the next slide. So what is a self-directed IRA? It means two things. It means one, you make all your own investment decisions and two, you can invest in non-traditional assets. So if you have an account with a brokerage firm and they tell you that you have a self-directed IRA with them, they don't. You, you're there, you actually don't because what they're saying is you can, you're going to pick your own stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, but they're limiting you to just stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. So a true self-directed IRA doesn't limit you. A true self-directed IRA and let you invest in things like real estate and notes and precious metals and uh, pretty much anything. Go ahead to the next one. So again, it, it gives you the ability to diversify and not just be limited to stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Go ahead to, and all, when you have an IRA, it requires that account to be held by a custodian, a bank or a brokerage firm uh, is who people typically have their accounts with. We are, uh, we have our own trust company. We are a financial services company. So we act as custodian but we're not a fiduciary, so we don't provide the advice. So an account with us, a traditional IRA, a Roth IRA, a SEP IRA, has all the same contribution rules, distribution rules, uh, limitations from a standpoint of, of, again, contributions, distributions, but the difference is with us, you can invest in non-traditional assets. Uh, so the different types of accounts, you can have tax deferred, which would be a traditional IRA, or you can have tax-free, which would be a Roth IRA. Again, those rules don't change with us as they would with any bank or brokerage firm. Go to the next one. So how do you do a, an IRA, a self-directed IRA? You open an account with a self-directed custodian, which is what Entrust is. You fund that account. You transfer a rollover money from your current custodian to your account with us. And then you instruct us to purchase the investment you wanna make and it's purchased in the name of your IRA. So if you were to invest with Pine Financial Group, for example, you're gonna invest in one of their offerings. They're gonna submit the paperwork, the subscription agreement to you. You have to complete that in the name of your IRA as the investor. The name of your IRA with us would be the Untrust Group for benefit of your name and account number. That's the name of your IRA. So if you were to buy real estate, or if you were to do your own trust deed investing and not go through Pine, for example, the lender and the deed of trust holder wouldn't be you as a person. Again, it would be your IRA. It would be the Untrust Group, FBO, your name and account number. FBO stands for for benefit of. Uh, so we're going to take the questions now. But before we do that, just a little, little information about what's coming up. Go ahead to the next one. We have another uh, our monthly webinar, the next one is going to be investing in storage units. 
Uh, we're going to have a survey at the end of this, so please uh, answer and let, let us know how uh, you feel like we've done with this webinar. And if you have any other topics that you'd like for us to talk about, we're open to suggestions. Uh, if you need more information on self-direct IRAs, you can go to our website and specifically the Learning Center has all kinds of things about self-directed IRAs, including uh, different investment options like trustees. We have some information on there. That's where this webinar will end up after this. And we're on social media. So if you want to stay, uh, stay up to date on things, follow us on social media. Yeah, and then Bill, uh, Andrew arm wrestled me to throw this in here quick. Um, <laughs> we, we're, I think, I think you guys are going to be out for this. Um, we do this event in Denver once a year. It's the largest real estate investor conference um, in the state, uh, mostly for local investors. We have local speakers. No, no money up there selling courses or coaching. There's nothing to buy. Uh, it's only thirty nine bucks, and if if you register this month, it's two for one. So that just covers our costs. We don't make any money on this. It's just really networking and education and primarily for Colorado. Yeah. And I presented it at yours last year. I, I was one of the speakers at it. Last yeah. Year. Yeah. Thank you for that. Go ahead. Next one. Okay. Q and a go to the next one after this, Kevin. So we're going to leave the, uh, our contact information up there. Uh, so if you have, you know, if you want to reach out to either of us, there's our there's our information. All right, let's jump right into the question. So the first one is for you, Kevin. Uh, can you uh, suggest any books on trustee investing? Uh, there's not very many out there. So I actually have a transcript written for one right now. We're getting ready to get it over to the editor. So maybe a year or so I'll have one out. Um, but I, I just I haven't found a great book on trustee investing, but I would definitely get on Amazon and, and Google that there is three or four out there. Um, I just think that there's some holes in each. I've read them all. I think there's some missing pieces, um, but maybe if you combine them all, then then it'll help. Um, but yeah, I wish I had a great recommendation. Uh, I just don't. All right. Next question for you again. Uh, are non-performing notes something to seek out for foreclosure related upside? To avoid due or to avoid due to risk liquidity or to manage reluctantly as a contingency when performing notes become non performing notes? Sure, I totally understand the question, but I think the beginning piece of that question, anyways, is, is it smart to buy non performing? Um, so I can tell you a quick story, Bill. I, I bought, I paid $190,000. I, I bought a note that was in default. They, they haven't made payments on it for 11 years. And I tried to get it to perform. So I called called the lady and said, I know you want to keep your house. You've been living there a long time. Let's work something out. I was going to discount it, reduce payments. I was going to do all of that. Um, she just ignored me. So we started the foreclosure process. Well, she ended up getting a free attorney, like a court-appointed attorney, and put up this big fight. And I'm about 40 grand, in, 40 grand on top of the 190 I paid into this fight um, so there is some risk when buying non-performing loans. Now it's all going to work out okay. I think the house is worth about 400, so we're still going to come out okay. Uh, but it's a, a lot more expensive to get a hold of that property than I was ever expecting. I think the point of this webinar was more the performing notes. So you're just producing monthly cash flow that just building up your IRA account. Um, so I don't know if that answered the question, but maybe. Um, Maybe it seems like it seems like can... contained within that question are non-performing notes something to seek out for foreclosure related upside. Basically, grabbing non-performing notes with the hope that it doesn't that you can then foreclose on the property almost seems like what they're asking is it's a way to grab a property, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I did, and it's gonna be, it's gonna turn out okay. But we're about eighteen months into the process, so yeah, it's possible, but they could always fight, right? And they could always file yeah. bankruptcy and there's there's different things that they could do. Plus, it seems to me that the whole benefit of doing trustee investing is that you're investing in real estate without having to become uh, a, a landlord, right? Basically, I mean, that's, you know, if, if, if you just go, go try and find a, a property to buy, you know, rather than grabbing it through a non-foreign note. But anyway, um, so next one, um, again, for, for you, Kevin, we can do due diligence, but if the borrower is signing the note as an LLC, not as an individual, so otherwise, other if an LLC is the borrower rather than a person, doesn't that mean we can't go after the borrower's asset if he turns delinquent? 
I mean, that would be true unless you have a personal guarantee. So most of our borrowers are LLC. It's very common, um, but we have the borrower listed as the LLC and also listed in the note is the guarantor, which is going to be an individual, a warm body, we call it. Um, so now when they sign the note at the bottom, they're signing on behalf of the LLC as the member or manager, and they're signing personally with joint and several liability. So now the LLC and the individual are both 100 responsible for the debt. So I could go after either one. Um, so that's how we do it. Um, and I would actually recommend highly that you get personal guarantees. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to throw add on to that, that if um, an IRA is the borrower, then the account holder is not allowed to be a, is not allowed to provide a personal guarantee. Right. Whether it's through the IRA or through an LLC itself. So just. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Bill. And we do loan to IRAs. So yeah. in that case, that's flipping the switch. Right. We're now we're not the IRA is not the lender. The IRA is the borrower. The IRA is the borrower. If, yeah. you're if the IRA is the IRA. borrower. Right. Exactly. If the IRA yeah. is the borrower. If the IRA um, is a borrower, you can't have personal recourse. So I would lower right. my loan to value to make sure that there is no reason to have recourse. So like virtually eliminate a chance of loss. Like yeah. I mean, just lower it, your loan to value. Yeah. Most um, lenders, like non-recourse lenders to IRAs, I mean, a minimum is, th is 30% down, if not 40%. Um, okay. What's the definition of junior versus senior position? Oh, good question. I, I apologize for going over that quickly and not being clear on that. A senior position is going to be the first mortgage, and uh, anything behind that would be a junior. So you can have a second mortgage or a third mortgage. So think about your primary home. Maybe you have a uh, a mortgage with your bank, Chase Bank, let's say, and then you have a, a line of credit with a credit union that, you know, a HELOC. That HELOC is going to be a junior position, which only means that the first position has to be paid off in full before any money goes to the junior. So it's like a waterfall in the event of a default. First lien gets paid, then the second, then the third, and then the owner. All right, here's a question that came in by email. Um, so Kevin, you're not seeing it. And the question is, I'm in California. Can I legally originate a loan without a license in California? That sounds like a question for an attorney. Um, I do. Yeah. I know that uh, California is pretty strict, but I think there's some um, uh, licensing exemptions for a limited number of deals. Uh, but I would definitely get an attorney on the phone for that one. Yeah. All right, here's one for me. Can I hold stocks or exchange traded funds in a self-directed IRA with Ventrust Group? If yes, are there fees to buy or sell these? So unfortunately, we're not a brokerage firm and we don't currently have a trading platform to hold exchange traded stocks, bonds, mutual funds. We did it one time. I mean, over the 40 years, 40 some years we've been in business, we've had a platform, then we haven't had a platform. The last time we had one, it was provided through um, interactive brokers. And unfortunately, they it kept failing. They, they would do updates and then not inform us. And we essentially had to give, like we had to just say, look, this isn't worth it. And so since then, we haven't had a platform for holding stocks, bonds, mutual funds. We're working on a relationship with someone to provide a platform for us. Um, but from an IT standpoint, we have other bigger projects that are going on. So we hope to have one again soon. But at this moment, we are focused entirely on holding just, um, you know, alternative assets. Uh, OK, the next one's for me as well. If you have an existing self-directed IRA that owns an investment property, that has a non-recourse loan that's not paid off against it, can you roll over money from a traditional IRA to this self-directed IRA to pay off the non-recourse loan early? Yes, you can You can transfer money from an IRA with another custodian to your IRA with Entrust, as long as it's the same type of IRA. And by same type of IRA, what I mean is, is that it's a pre-tax IRA that you're transferring from. So like if you have a Roth IRA that's holding that investment property in the note, you can't transfer from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA. You'd have to convert it from a traditional to a Roth and then do a Roth to Roth transfer. But if your current self-directed IRA that's holding the investment property is a pre-tax account, like a SEP IRA or another traditional IRA, then you can certainly transfer more money from another pre-tax account or roll over from a 401k. Um, okay, next question. Uh, again, Kevin, for you, can you touch on the fractional investing again? The way I understand what you said was not to say be one of four investors on a $400,000 note. Yeah. 
Yeah, there, so there's a right and a wrong way to do this. So say there's a $400,000 note and you have four pals, four buddies that all want to go in and they each want to do a $100,000 investment. So one way you can do that is to fractionalize that note and you each own 25% of it. In my opinion, that would be the incorrect way to do that uh, because it's that works great until there's a default and then that creates a lot of problems, a lot of undefined responsibilities. So a better way to handle that situation is to maybe structure a entity like an LLC or some type of joint venture where you spell out all the roles, all the responsibilities, what happens in these scenarios in this situation, and you get it all in writing that you all sign and understand, and then you make the investment into the $400,000 loan. Um, but you are able to fractionalize notes and assign or sell just portions of it. So we do see notes owned by multiple parties at times. Okay, um, this one's for me. How does IRA funds get used to pay for expenses like insurance taxes? Yeah, if your IRA owns the property, your IRA is responsible to pay those expenses. With Entrust, you essentially have one of two ways. You send us the invoice and tell us to pay it. We pay it from the account. Or we also offer the option for you to get uh, what we call a My Direction Visa card. It's a debit card where you can get a card transfer money from your card onto that account, onto that debit card, and then use that debit card to pay the expenses provided they take Visa, obviously. Now, this all assumes that your IRA has direct title on that real estate. Some people will have their IRA invest in an LLC, and then the LLC holds, real, holds the title on the real estate. In that case, the LLC would pay the expenses. But in either case, it's still IRA money that's being used, whether it's through the LLC as a pass-through or the IRA directly. But I mean, the short answer to your question is, how does IRA funds get used? You you instruct your custodian to pay, pay the bill, um, whatever it is. So with us, you can submit it through, you have an online portal that you can log into your account and, and submit the invoice for payment, and then we'll pay it from the account. Uh, Kevin, can you do a 1031 exchange and a trustee investment? Gosh, this is the, the question I get, I swear, like four or five times a month. The answer to the question is no, but I really am trying to figure this out. So we have attorneys and CPAs working on trying to understand it. But the problem here is a 1031 is a like kind exchange. And so if you're selling a rental property, for example, and not buying another rental or another piece of real estate, it's not a like kind. And if you're going from real estate, a real estate asset to a paper asset, which is what a trustee investment is, it's just, it's not the same. So you can't do a 1031. Um, I've heard of some ways you could do it with like trusts, um, but it's questionable if, if those are even legal. So we, I guess the simple answer is no, we, we, we can't do that. You know, I, I did a, I've done a pre presentations for like groups where they had me come in and talk about self-directed IRAs and then a 1031 guy come on and talk. And it's been a while, but I could have sworn they were they had said that you can do like you can 1031 into a non real estate from real estate into non real estate. But I might. I might be misremembering that. Yeah, um, I'm not a 1031 expert, but that is not my understanding. Yeah, I. Yeah. And I there are 1031 companies that you might want to ask that question to um, as well. Um, Mohammed, I'm, I'm brief. I'm, I'm give, tell, saying that to you. You could reach out to a 1031 company and ask them about that. Um, the next question is asking about your fees, James. What are typical fees charged by Pine Financial Group? So we don't charge investors any fees. Uh, we make our money in a spread, and the fees we charge the borrower. So we'll charge the borrower. Typically, it's two percent of the loan amount in a fee, and then we might charge twelve percent on the note. And then we would pay our investor like 10, 11%, something like that. So we have a little bit of a spread there. So that's that's how we make our money. Now, if you're out there doing deals on your own, you should be able to charge two-ish, two to three, maybe a little bit more depending on your market to the borrower to borrow the money and increase your returns that way. Uh, next question, what is the typical duration of these loans? I'm guessing he's talking about trustee type lending in general, or maybe specifically you, or maybe you could answer both of those. Yeah, I think it's going to be pretty standard. Um, these are fix and flip loans. So as quickly as the borrower can get in and out of a project, that's the term, right? Now we, we do our loans for nine months, but they typically pay off 
we were seeing four, four and a half months. Um, as the interest rate environment changed, those that on the market longer, so now we're closer to six and a half months. Um, our average payoff is closer to six and a half. So I guess I'll give you an idea, but each market could be a little bit different, but in no case would I think you should expect it to go over nine months. It does because the clients take forever to do their construction sometimes, so you'll see it, um, but you should not expect that. Uh, okay, on this is about fractionalization again. How about investing in a single fund that contains dozens or hundreds of notes? I see adverts like these all the time. The idea is diversification. Yep. So I, when I started the business in 2008, I didn't have any type of fund. I was really just an individual private money investor and an individual real estate investor. And I would just bring them together. So you really did have to fund the entire thing. Well, the feedback I got, Bill, was, well, these investment amounts are too high. They're not diversified over a bunch of different loans um, and there's no liquidity. So we solved that with the mortgage fund. That was in 2009, we created that first mortgage fund. So what we do is you, you invest in the fund and it's diversified over lots and lots of loans in different markets. Um, I, I really do think diversification keeps you safe. So I don't know if my little story there answered the question, but yes, diver diversify into a fund probably makes sense especially for IRA investors, because you could reinvest the interest. You don't have to take it each month. Um, and so you can have compound growth. But the next one isn't a question. It's a comment that follows up on our, our, our 1031 exchange that says, um, just FYI, the Delaware Statutory Trust, yeah. DST, is a 1031 alternative. That's the one I was talking about. So I would just be very careful. And some people tell me it's totally legitimate. And it's, 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 you could do it. And then some very highly educated people tell me to stay away from it. So yeah, I would I, just I think, say be careful. And I think we go, but both go back to our disclosures, which says seek the advice of attorneys and yeah. financial advisors, et cetera. Et cetera. Yeah, we're, as a company, we're choosing not to participate in it, but yeah. I know. Right, last, last question. And unless I get more, if you have, okay, this one's for me. If you have a rental home in a self-directed IRA, does the rent collected get deposited directly into the account through interest? Well, Typically, yes. Um, your IRA owns the investment, so your uh, your IRA owns the property, so your IRA receives the rent. But there is some alternatives in terms of how it necessarily can get paid. Like one of them is if your IRA. Now, again, this assumes your IRA holds direct title on the property. If you structure it through an LLC, then the LLC holds direct title on the property, and the IRA owns the LLC. The LLC owns the property. So in that case. The rent would get paid to the LLC, and then from the LLC, it would flow back to the IRA at whatever time frame you want. The other option, which is one that I exercise in my rental property that I hold in my self-directed IRA, is I use a property manager as a third party, and I have the rent get paid to the property manager. The property manager keeps an individual account established for, for my, for my um, rental income, and so the rent gets paid there. And then they also receive any expenses like property tax and insurance, and they pay it out of the account. And so everything's done by the property manager. But the key is the property manager is a non-disqualified third party to me. I can't be my own property manager or my non-existent spouse or, or, or non-existent kids or like anybody that's a disqualified person to your IRA can't be that third party, but you can use a non-disqualified third party who can receive the rent. Now, the the rent eventually has to flow back to the IRA before you can take it as a withdrawal um, or transfer it to a different custodian or anything like that. But that is an option if you don't want to have the tenant pay directly to the IRA. You can have them pay to a non-disqualified third party like a property manager. It can't go to you, right, as the account holder. You're a disqualified person. So you can't keep a separate account that you receive the rent to. It either has to get paid to the IRA or to a neutral third party like property manager. Uh, okay, that's it. Kevin, really great uh, webinar. Uh, there's our, our contact information. Feel free to reach out. And again, um, if you're in the Denver area or if you're just interested in traveling there for an event, um, they've got that the one coming up uh, next month. Really appreciate it, everybody who joined and all the great questions. Everybody have a great day. Kevin, thanks again. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Andrew.